Welcome to the Process Breakdown Podcast, where we talk about streamlining and scaling operations of your company, getting rid of bottlenecks, and giving your employees all the information they need to be successful at their jobs. Now, let's get started with the show. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, host of the Process Breakdown Podcast, where we talk about streamlining and scaling operations of your company, getting rid of bottlenecks, and giving your staff everything they need to be successful at their job. Check out past episodes. Ted, I'd like to mention a couple of past episodes. There was an episode with David Allen of Getting Things Done, which was great. Uh, Michael Gerber of The E-Myth, uh, which was also great, and, and many, many more. Uh, before I introduce today's guest, this episode is brought to you by Sweet Process. And Ted, you pr probably can relate to this, maybe. Everyone can out there. If you've had team members ask you the same questions over and over, and it may be the 10th time you spend explaining it, well, there's actually a better way. There's a solution. Sweet Process is a software that makes it drop dead easy to train and onboard new staff and save time with existing staff. And I was talking with one of the founders, Owen. Not only do universities, banks, hospitals, and software companies use them, but first responder government agencies use them in life or death situations to run their operations. So you can use Sweet Process to document all the repetitive tasks that eat up your precious times. So you can focus on growing your company. You could sign up for a free 14-day trial. No credit cards required. Go to sweetprocess.com. It's sweet like candy, S-W-E-E-T, process.com. I'm excited for today's guest. Ted Foliani, he has uh, owned and managed businesses in San Diego for the past 25 years. And you should have more gray hair, Ted, according <laughs> to this. But in 2016, he founded ShipCalm, which is an e-commerce focused logistics and distribution company. And Ted and ShipCalm's leadership team, they've grown ShipCalm into a national player in the e-commerce distribution landscape. And Ted is an operations centric CEO, and that's why we're having him on. And he's seen the roles he plays in the early stage of companies, identifying businesses that scale with process-driven operations, supported by hiring great people who, who drive that great process. So, Todd, thanks for joining me. Uh, happy to be here. Thanks for including me in this, in this topic. It's something I've been doing for a long time. So happy to, happy to share my stories. Tell people a little bit more about ShipCalm and what you do. Yeah, so uh, ShipCom is a, a 3PL, a third-party logistics company that does uh, fulfillment. Uh, we are an omni-channel fulfillment center, which means that we do direct-to-consumer. We ship a lot of product to and through Amazon. We ship to retail. There is actually still brick and mortar out there, everybody. So we, we also ship to brick and mortar. So we, uh, you know, the, the, there's a lot of 3PLs, and we, we, we glad the industry is growing. Um, not all of them do on omni-channel, not all of them do Amazon, not all of them do retail. And so we've, we've decided to sort of focus our software systems and people on being able to support all channels. And so we warehouse product, we uh, keep track of the product, and then when orders come in, we ship them out to customers. And, you know, our mission is to make our customers more successful. And we find that getting their product to customers quickly and safely is, is how we do that. Why do you start this company? There's a lot of moving pieces. Yeah, well, so I started this business because uh, uh, in, in a little tongue in cheek, it was the exact opposite of my last business, right? I, I came out of a manufacturing business, which it really has led us to why we're such a process driven 3PL, which I would, I'm sure we'll talk about today. Um, but I was looking for a business that didn't, didn't carry inventory, had a short AR process and had very good gross margins. And those were the three pieces on the napkin, the three notes I had made myself. And after some analysis, I, I focused in on this business and it just drove me to, uh, it's a business that, you know, has a lot of moving pieces. It's simple and not that complicated and didn't have a lot of capital expense to get started. So um, that was the initial driver. I, I liked the gross margins and I liked that it was a people space play. Yeah. It's, so it's other people's inventory, not your own inventory. I love other people's inventory. I think that, and, and many businesses struggle with inventory, right? Turns and carrying costs and obsolete inventory. And I, and I, and I surely had some struggles in my career dealing with that in my prior business. And um, I had decided that I did not want to um, continue to have that be my use of capital model. And so that's what got me to here. So talk about what that means when I say operation-centric CEO. Uh, it, means that I, it means that I want to be the COO. It means that I, I, I love spending time on the operations floor. I love being around the actual processes that we're doing. Um, 
you know, they, they, I, I do my management by walking around. I love to be out on the floor and shake the hands and say hi to the, the people that are running our business. Um, and, but I, they don't let me get stuck out there as much as my heart wants me to be out there. Right. So I just love being in the heat of the battle. I love being in the operational piece of it. Uh, I grew up doing that. I was, I mean, I spent my, my whole career has been in operation. So it's just that I, I, I have a, a passion for improving the speed at which we do something, improving the quality at which we do something, even if that means slowing it down and setting up the people that are doing it to do it very efficiently against the time standard that we all agree is fair. So I just yeah. love that. I love doing that. Yeah. And, um, you know, how did you discover, I guess, what are some of the tools you used for efficiency, productivity, and systems? How did you discover Sweet Process? Well, I was, I was, um, I have used over the years a lot of ways to write work instructions, revision control work instructions, get work instructions in front of the people that are actually doing them. You know, work instructions aren't designed that someone's looking at it all day long, every day. If you do a task a thousand times, you probably don't need to have the work instruction sitting on the table in front of you. You have to have access to it to be reminded visibly up in the workspace. That's great. Uh, and I was, and I've been hunting for years for something that was easy to do. And the thing that got me attracted to sweet process was that writing revision one of the procedure, it's the easiest thing in the market. I've looked at them all, right? Revision one was the easiest thing to do with these guys. You can have a work instruction up. Well, let me internalize it. We could write a work instruction in three minutes. And my requirement in our, in our environment is you don't do anything without a work instruction. It's a great rule, right? It's hard to follow. And with sweet process, I'm actually able to tell people it takes two minutes. I don't need the perfect version. I need version one. And it's, without even a template, like you can just go new procedure, new process, enter, 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 enter. At least there's something to put in front of somebody literally in, in a minute, in two minutes. That's what attracted us to, to it. And then once we got into it, all the other feature sets were, were surely industry standard, revision control, approval process, you know, building up knowledge bases. You know, what, what really got us hooked on it was we use it internally. And there's also a public facing side of this, which lets us put our customer facing knowledge bases to our customers. So we're using it on both sides of the, uh, both sides of the table, so to speak. Um, I didn't know about that when I first, you know, found the software, but was surely very excited when we, we realized it could go both ways. So the first thing you wanted was an easy version one. I wanted right? to be able to write a procedure quickly. Yeah. And I wanted, I wanted anybody with reasonable training skill set who could type to be able to do one very easily. I needed, I needed the excuse to not be, well, I've got to develop this flow chart and format this thing over here. And then I got to cut and paste this over here. I, that wasn't going to work in this environment where we absorb multiple customers a day. I have to write new procedures every single day. It could, I could not afford the time of, you know, of a more elaborate solution. Not that the elaborate solution is even better, by the way, because I've had those and they're not better. Um, but I needed, I needed to be able to write them very quickly. Because you may have a different workflow for each, a slightly different workflow for each customer. One hundred percent. Yeah, it's, it's 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 a it's a possibility and a reality. Um, and uh, those customers are coming in fast and furiously, and and they're adding products, and they're adding SKUs, and they're adding gift wrapping, and they're adding different packouts. And you throw Amazon into the equation with the specifics on where where is the FNSQ going to be placed? How's the shrink wrap going to happen? Um, it needs to be very, very flexible, very fluid. I'm curious what have you found as valuable features of it? And you mentioned one that is customer facing. Mm -hmm. So this is valuable for the customer too. What, like, give me an example of what would the customer be seeing as a customer facing piece? Yeah. So, uh, so our customers need to define how they want us to ship products. I want you to use FedEx. I want it, anything above a pound, use this. Anything under a pound, use this. And we all want to see that information. And I want them to see what we're doing. I want to make sure nothing's been lost in translation. And so we have taken those processes and we have put them into the knowledge base section of the uh, of, of sweet process to where our customers have access to that. And what we say to them is, here's how we've interpreted what you've told us. You've told us to gift wrap this. We want to match your user experience to your end customer, right? It's very important to people how I'm shipping to their end customer. And 
We just tell them, go look at it. Now, they may not need all of my internal processes for how I receive and how I move it to this location and how I put it into license plates, but I'm very happy to have them review how I think I'm going to be building their product. And they literally go to their custom URL. So we use, it's a sweet process driven URL. They open up the knowledge base. They can see shipping profiles, packaging profiles, mm. a lot of data that we want them to validate that we have interpreted it properly. That's valuable. Yeah. Because then they're just double checking it and you have another set of eyes instead of maybe a, uh, one of your team members having to get on the phone with them and reviewing it. Just well, like, here I'm it is. Doing that, I'm doing that without a user's license. Well, yeah. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm getting a, they're actually now a user, so to speak, through a free link. Yeah, I have users for my own team, right. but I have hundreds of customers. I don't want to pay a license fee for every customer of mine to go into my process system, right? But so that's a, that's a huge value because historically, it's like, well, I'll email you the process and let's make sure it's okay. It doesn't work anymore. It has to be digital. So it's, it's a great value to us. Yeah. What other features do you find that are valuable for you? So I like, there's, there's two pieces that are sort of connected. One is the, the management approval process. So I get, let's, I'm going to say me, I write a procedure and I want these six people to approve it. I put that into a, I won't bore you with the, 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 the inside pieces of it, but I can assign that to those seven people and it won't be released until they all sign off on it. Mm. Okay. Ted's asked you to approve this procedure, review the procedure. They do that wherever they are in our company. They sign their name and it gets approved. So there's a, there's a management approval process that goes on. The second piece is, is I can assign people to be trained on it and I can track that training. Mm. Now, I come from manufacturing medical device where I actually had to prove that to the FDA that my people touching it were approved. I don't have that requirement in this business, but if I was a customer of mine, I would say, hey, how do I know that, that Mike knows how to do my stuff? And I can say, oh, well, well, Mike's been trained on it. Here he had an hour and a half. It was tracked right here. Here's Mike signing off on it. Again, not as critical putting a sweater into a box as it was building a scanning system for someone's brain, but, but it's still nice to know that Mike's been trained and that Mike's read the procedure. So that's, that's, uh, uh, that should be like a slogan of ship calm Tad, which is like, we've created scanners of brains. We can get your sweater in a box <laughs> yes, or something yes, like right. that. It's like, <laughs> yeah. I, I feel roadside bomb defense. I think I can put a yeah. sweater in a box. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, it makes, it probably makes your, your customers, you know, be able to sleep better at night knowing not only can they see it, but it's happened. All the other stuff is happening behind the scenes. There's a specific process and you're very organized. Not only you are organized, but the company's organized. Yeah. I mean, in order to scale, it's, you know, and, and, and it changes, right? And, and every company faces growing pains. And I think Sweet Process has been a way for us to manage the growing pains. We're, we, we have them. Like, there's no company that should ever tell you they never had growing pains. And in this economy and what's going on with COVID, we're growing and it, and it's, it's, it has pains that come along with it. Your systems get stretched and your people get stretched and your facilities get stretched. And, and Sweet Process has, a, how, has allowed us to have that be mitigated as much as possible because it does, it does scale, by the way, it has incredible scale capabilities, but imagine trying to do this the way that we worked for the first six months at this business, which is, hey, that's not how that's supposed to happen. Do it this other way. Okay. That doesn't work when you have hundreds of customers in three, you know, multiple facilities. So um, it, we would have really struggled if we didn't have it in place during this, this growth spurt we've had. Ted, who are the type of, who are ideal clients for you or customers? So, you know, I mean, I, I, we all like people that are shipping a thousand to 2000 units a day that we get really good at it. There's repetition. It's repetitive. Your pricing gets to a good point. Um, we, we have four personas that, or maybe five personas that we, that we work with. We still have an appetite for early stage companies. I'm an early stage guy. I'm an entrepreneur. I have a place in my business and in my heart for someone that doesn't even have a great chance of success. Like I can see them and go, this is not going to go well. But I'm going <laughs> to give you a shot, right? And so we bring customers in. Well, they probably appreciate your advice on that too. You they, know, you know I think, do they I ever th ask you advice? Oh, you know, yeah. I mean, I, I, I tell people all the time, my early, the early years of this business, if you came in to work with us, I'd say, first question I'd say is how's your gross margins? And they're like, wait a minute, I'm here to just have you ship my stuff. Why are you asking me about my gross margins? I said, just work with me for a second. I go, no. what are your gross margins? They're like, they're amazing. They're so amazing. I go, what are they? They're like, they're 50%. 
I'm buying this yoga mat for 20 bucks and I'm selling it for 40. And I would go, that's so great. You're going to be out of money in 4.3 months. Hmm. Like, what are you talking about? I go, well, what about freight? What about Amazon's fees? What about insurance? What about returns? What? And they're like, and then they, their eyes get lost. You know, the tears haven't started yet, but, but it's a little bit of a dream killer moment, right? But that doesn't mean that they're done. It just means how do we help them work through that? Raise your price, beat up on your vendor, you know, because my dollar 50 or my dollar or my 75 cents to fulfill it is not your problem. Your problem is a margin structure and a cost acquisition cost and a, and a lifetime value cost. So, you know, I, I think they like hearing the truth from someone like me. And we do a lot of strategy sessions with our customers, which is not yeah. normal. But, but we have an appetite for that early stage company and we, we bring them in and we know that some of them are going to churn out. You know, Amazon is yeah. amazing, but Amazon's not for everybody. And Amazon's got to make a buck, too. Uh, so we, we, de we definitely expect churn on some of those. We call them rookies, mm -hmm. D2C rookies and, and Amazon rookies. They're new, right? They have a chance of yeah. success. It's going to be hard for them. And then we have pros. We have people that have been doing it for a long time. And you can be a pro with one person and one product. It doesn't matter the size of the business. We have pros that are just launching. But they're, they're well-backed. They're well-funded. They know what they're talking about. They know they, they're ready to spend money on marketing. And so, you know, we like D2C pros. You know, we like Amazon pros. You know, we process hundreds of thousands of units to Amazon every month. We do a lot of heat shrinking and bundling and FN skewing and all that wonderful stuff. Um, we love that business, right? It's, it, the margins go down a little bit as the volume goes up, but, but we're smart about how we quote things. Uh, so I know it's a really crappy answer to say we like everybody. Well, you were saying four personas. And, and by the way, that's super valuable because, listen, you both win together. All the people who help as partners with this e-commerce company. So by getting really great advice from you, been in the trenches and other people, you both win, you know? Um, so you were mentioning the four personas. So one of them, would you say is a D to C rookie? Would that be? Yeah, D to C rookie, a D to C pro, an Amazon rookie. And then we call them Amazon brands that they're actually a brand at Amazon. Like they actually have a presence. They have a, they, they're a brand on Amazon. And then we have sort of this fifth category, which we, we sometimes we call it B2B. Sometimes we call it enterprise where, you know, maybe they're just Uber omni-channel. Like, you know, we have a customer that does, you know, beef jerky of all things, right? And they do, they're Walmart D2C, they're Walmart stores, they're retail, they're, they're D2C on their own site, they're eBay, they're, they're actually every channel. The good thing for us is that's not an every 3PL solution. Like if there's a thousand 3PLs, there's 20 that can do that for them, right? If they didn't do Walmart retail, there's maybe 40. If they didn't do Walmart D2C, maybe there's 50. And if they just did Amazon, maybe there's 50. I don't know. Um, but the, those are kind of enterprise B2B that they're, they're a pretty established brand, maybe international brand. Um, that's kind of the five that fit, you know, 99% of the categories. You know, that every now and then there's someone that doesn't fit perfectly into those categories, but those are our main personal. Are there certain products, Ted, that you don't take? Like any perishable, I don't know, anything that you don't, uh, that you I'm maybe turn really away. Hard to stay away from produce. I mean, we don't do produce. I, it's, it's a different monster. You know, perishable um, it has an expiration that could be hours and days instead of, you know, months and weeks. So right. I think there's other people that, and, and I'm, not, I'm not big enough from a facility standpoint yet to do produce. I mean, you've got to be inside the population center. You've got to be in Brooklyn. You've got to be downtown LA. You've got to be in the middle of San Francisco or in the middle of Seattle, you can't be in the lower rent district out in, you know, out in Jersey and try to service the 6 million people in it. You got to be in the, in the, in the, in the space. And so we're not ready to do that yet. And I don't, I don't think we're going to need to do produce. I think there's other people that are better at that. And I think this is Ted futuristically speaking. I think that a lot of that's going to come from standard brick and mortar is going to be feeding your, you know, I think Walmart's going to have a lot of warehouses as soon as they convert all their stores to just being distribution centers like in addition to being a retail store. So I think those people are going to be better at produce than I'll ever be. So we're not, we're not doing produce. We do a lot of CBD. We are just starting to do alcohol. Uh, we do perfume, which a lot of people don't like to do perfume. Uh, so yeah, there's not much we wouldn't do, but we don't do a lot of open food produce. Got it. Yeah. Thank you. Cause I know there's a lot of different products. You've probably seen a lot of different products. What's been uh, a strange product? that you have had a customer with? Well, one of my funnest was water balloons, which we have a very big seller of water balloons and it's amazing. Water balloons. Water balloons, tons of water balloons. Yeah, 
uh, vendor central dropship. Um, so big volume. That one's fun. You know, a lot of people, it, it's seasonal. It's a little seasonal. Uh, I, I love cosmetics and I love supplements, but they're light and expensive, right? So everybody's winning. Customers winning. Our customers winning. They, the, the fulfillment price, you know, if someone's selling something for $8 and I tell them it costs a dollar to provide fulfillment, it doesn't work. But I didn't tell you to sell it for $8. Sell it for $16, you know? So we run into struggles with lower priced items that it's not even us, it's any fulfillment price isn't gonna work for them. And so things that cost 29, 19, maybe, maybe, maybe 19, spending four to 7% on your fulfillment fees as a percentage of revenue is okay. Spending 12 is expensive. It's a lot to go. So I do a lot of analysis on what's my, what am I gonna cost as a percentage of my customer's revenue? And when it's two, three, four, five, let's go. This is good for everybody. When it's nine or 10, there's either a pricing issue or they better, they better have a really, really, really low cost of goods. Mm. Yeah. So what do they do in that case? Because someone's got to ship it. Do they just do it themselves? You know, my or... one of my favorite stories, we had a guy that came in with a hockey puck. He sold the hockey pucks for 89 cents and I gave him a fulfillment price of a dollar. <laughs> and we, all, we, both, we both laughed for a while, right? I was like, I go, he goes, what do you want me to do with this? I go, what do you want me to do with this? I go, I go so what I tell him? Sell a 10 pack. You're right. Sell a bucket of them or something. Yeah. Sell, yeah, sell a bucket. Right. Oh yeah. I, I guess maybe we can do T to C. And I'm like, all of a sudden I become a strategic advisor to these companies about trying to go into these e-commerce channels where they had always just sold a bucket of these to, to retail, to REI or whoever it is. Right. And they're like, well, I'm going to sell these online. And they put it up for sale and they're like, whoa, whoa, wait, whoa, wait a minute here. My freight was $3 to sell the 89, 89 cent item. Guys, Rate's important, rate's really important. So sell a bucket. So we have those, so I think they either have to not, not be an e-commerce item, which is not a great thing to be because you kind of need e-commerce to be in part of your supply chain um, or bundle. We do a lot of bundling. I mean, even on Amazon, it's hard to sell a $9.99 item on Amazon for the same reason. Amazon's got a fee, there's freight that's involved, there's a fulfillment fee that's involved. So we do a ton of bundling, taking $5 item, items and turning them into a $29 skew. Yeah. Good value for the customer too. So they could send you all of them, whatever, a thousand of them. And then if an order comes in for 10 or 20 or 30, you can bundle them there on site for them. Yeah. Usually, or do they have to send them to you ahead of time in that particular package? It's just two, it's two different prices, right? We, and this, is a, this is where my operations head kind of turns on with these customers is if you let me pre-assemble the kits, it's a lower price. There's some economies to scale of running a line of these things. If I have to, on every individual order, grab 10 different pieces, it's just slower. Yeah. It's the difference of 10 cents an item to 40 cents an item to the customer. And so that's just an analysis of, well, my supply chain's tight, I can't do that. That's okay, we can pull on demand. Yeah. It's just more efficient to make the SKU and then ship the SKU. So that's, that's just a math, that's yeah. just math. At that they point. could still send them all to you and then you could prepackage all of them on site yep. though. Yeah, yep. 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 That's, that's that makes sense. Doing. Two last questions, Ted. First of all, I love hearing your expertise. It's super valuable for anyone in, who thinks in systems or anyone in e-commerce in general. Um, one, what was the, what did you, uh, the onboarding process like with now using Sweet Process? Uh, with, for the with, for you, software in our world or for my customers? For you, me? yeah. It could be a new um, staff member or yeah. new onboard of a customer. I mean, it's, it's, I'm going to, I'm going to say seamless only because it feels that way. It probably isn't necessarily quite as easy as my impression of it is, but I mean, the, the, the learning curve on sweet process is, is numbers of hours or days. It's not numbers of weeks, right? Which is rare for a software implementation, right? So almost, I can't think of anybody in our company that can't use sweet process, which means it's broad enough that bandwidth is not an issue for onboarding because our biggest struggle as a company right now is onboarding is 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 the velocity and the accuracy and the completeness of it because when we don't onboard well you know <laughs> that's what we get right? Right. It's, all about, it's all about the onboarding so so because a lot of people can use sweet process in my environment most people can use the, those tools for the onboarding process and so um it's a very simple integration for us and our customers and also it was a simple integration for us in the sweet process because with a simple tool that's actually what should happen it should be simple on the way in and it should be simple on the way out. What do you feel has been the biggest game changer 
and using it for you. And you may have already said it. I don't know if it's the customer facing uh, help docs or, or something else. You know, I think it's, uh, it's the ability to share the hope, the desired user experience of our customer to their customer, right? With a visual aid, with a picture. Again, probably I goes without saying that it's really easy to upload photos and videos into Sweet Process or into any really good, you know, tool. So it's very easy to upload pictures. It's the ability to, to use a picture quickly to share to our operators that this is what it's supposed to look like when it ships. Mm. That's, that's, been the, that's been very helpful. I think there isn't one great, there isn't one single game changer because it's really the ability to use it throughout our system and on our company. But that's one that just pops into my head. It's been like, yeah, the procedure has a picture. We just, you operator just took the picture and look at that, it's right there. And, and it's a link, so it's updatable. Right. You don't end up with a with a rigid, firm, you know, unchangeable work instruction. You can actually rev it pretty easily, which is also important. Yeah. It's very flexible. Um, I want to point people, Ted, towards Shipcom. OK. Um, is there any other place online that we should point people towards to find out more about you and the company? Yeah, I mean, our website's, you know, shipcom.com. dot com. Um, it's a good place to kind of get a feel for our pricing and our skills and capabilities and, and, uh, you know, and surely there's connections to get to us. I mean, I'm from a, from a, Hey, let's talk through the industry or your company. I mean, I'm Ted at shipcom.com, not very complicated. I'm happy to, you know, respond and engage with people and, and talk about what I know and share operational stuff. And, and even if shipcom's not the right fit to talk about where they might be the right fit, because we fit a lot of people, but we don't fit everybody. And I know the industry pretty well. So I'm happy to share those, that, that information. Uh, but I think the website's a great place to start and, and uh, surely LinkedIn or TED at Shipcom is a great place to connect to me personally. Is there a next big goal for you and the company on what you want to achieve? You know, we're on a path to seven sites. I think that gives us a good presence here in the U.S. You know, we're not chasing, we're actually not chasing two-day ground. It'll happen. But we're actually chasing getting into environments uh, where we're close to developing e-commerce brand centers. You know, Austin's great. North Carolina's great. You know, Brooklyn's great. I just wish Brooklyn had buildings with higher ceilings. They just don't have buildings with higher ceilings. So we like to be close to our, we don't need to be close to our customers, but we found that there's a way to be close to our customers and also strategically planted from a distribution location. Uh, so we're actually combining those needs because uh, it's still nice to sit down with people. And it's a lot of these brands are, you know, mid-sized companies are letting their, it's their life, right? They like to come meet with us sometimes in person. And we haven't met half our customers. You know, we're earning trust on a phone call. We're earning trust on an email. And that's great. We love that. We take that very seriously. But we also like being close to our, close to our brands and where brands are being developed. So. Ed, I want to be the first one to thank you. Everyone check out shipcom.com. Check out Sweet Process. Check out more episodes of the podcast. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Jeremy. You're stuck. Thanks, bud. Thanks for listening to the Process Breakdown Podcast. Before you go, quick question. Do you want a tool that makes it easy to document processes, procedures, and or policies for your company so that your employees have all the information they need to be successful at their job? If yes, sign up for a free 14-day trial of Sweet Process. No credit card is required to sign up. Go to sweetprocess.com, sweet like candy, and process like process.com. Go now to sweetprocess.com and sign up for your risk-free 14-day trial. Hi, this is Owen, the CEO and co-founder here at Sweet Process. If you've enjoyed listening to this podcast interview, uh, actually, you know what I want you to do? Go ahead and leave us a five-star review on iTunes. That way we get more people aware of you know, the good stuff that you get here on this podcast. Again, go on to iTunes and leave us a five-star review. Looking forward to reading your review. Have a good day. That's awesome.